Warren, I want to I want to go, I, I want to sit with you, I want to go to lunch with you, and I, ha I just have this funny feeling in my gut. And I thought, well, that's an interesting invitation to lunch. <laughs> and so I went to lunch with her, and, um, and she's from a very wealthy family uh, whose family made a lot of money in oil stocks and also in uh, other extractive agriculture practices, uh, big, big agriculture. And it was mostly from her grandfather and her father where the money came from, and then she was inheriting all of it. And she, she just so, in her heart, wanted that money to convert into something that was life-giving, not to just leave a lineage in her family of extraction. <laughs> So she, she's sitting there, and we meet, at this, uh, we meet at this restaurant called The Farmer and the Cook. And she had never been there before. And we come in, and we sit down together. And she's like, Warren, I have this feeling about the stock market. And this was summer of 2008. And she says, there's this, this feeling that something's going to happen with it. And I just I feel like there needs to be, like I want to get my money out of oil stocks, and I just want to. <laughs> you know, do something uh, just natural, like, you know, and, and I was like, wow, like to convert it to soil, you know, to create stock in soil. She's like, oh my God, that's it. She said, I want all the soil that's been taken from the earth from this money in the making of this money. What if we could put it back as soil? What if we could turn, turn the energy of that money and where it came from into being soil building? And so we started to dialogue, what would that look like? And in that dialoguing process, six weeks later, the stock market crashed and they lost $20 million. Mm -hmm. So think about that for a second, because I look back and go, wow, what could a bunch of us permaculturists do with buying up farms with $20 million, which you know, has never come back to the family. It's still, it's, it's, it's been lost. But don't worry, they still had 30 million. So <laughs> it's okay, they're okay. Um, so we got in another process. Their family went through some turmoil, and it ended up, the whole thing ended up in her hands so that she could actually make the decision without having to convince everybody else in her family. And so we, I, she asked me to put together a prospectus. She said, what would a permaculture investment look like? And I said, you know what, let me, let me run through this and come up with some ideas. And again, permaculture is site context specific. So you can't make a proposal on something that you haven't seen. So it was important for me to do one as a hypothesis that would guide us toward the right property. So we looked at a lot of different um, things that were important to us, like we wanted to be within a certain distance of major markets who would appreciate food grown on a farm and who would buy directly from us. Very simple. We wanted to find a place that had a microclimate niche to the surrounding environment. We wanted to find a place that had a roadside capacity to be able to sell our wares right from, from the roadside, where we didn't have to drive into town, but people could, as they were passing by us, could also buy from us. There needed to be the ability of a, of a lot of rascally people moving out there to help us, because we couldn't do this alone. And we also wanted it to be somewhere our family wanted to live. This was really important to us as farmers, is that we didn't want to do this excluding the rest of our family who weren't farmers. But could they come and join with us in this? So there was, the, you know, the collapse that happened. And I put together this whole uh, prospectus that basically was a unique way of partnership where she was our bank. And we said, you know, <coughs> if, if we can find the right piece of land, what we would do is we would, we would ask you for a certain amount of money as our bank, and then in return there would be a re, uh, what I call an ROI, a return on investment that was moderate from an economic standpoint, but the other returns of investment would also be social capital and soil capital, ecological capital, and that that had to be valued by her family for this to work. The other thing I didn't want to have happen was that it ended up that we would just be working for her. We needed it to be, we need investment. So the way we designed the investment was that after 10 years, we had a buyout from her. So it was a very unique way of doing this, where we would buy her out in 10 years, but we would have half the capital. So all of our sweat equity, all of her equity financially, was split down the middle in the 10-year mark. 
so that at the end of 10 years, we both had put value into it. So our sweat equity actually had a lot of value in that. And then we would pay back what we borrowed from her plus half of her equity that she built. And we would use our equity to do that transformation. And so it was a really interesting way of looking at it. We had to also look at, was our community ready for this? And we found statistically 98% of the, uh, the food dollar in the Santa Barbara, California community was being spent outside of the region. Conversely, 97% of this big agricultural community, 97% of what was grown was being shipped out of the community. The trucks were passing in the night, so to speak. So I looked at that not as a problem, but as a what? Solution. Absolutely. Like here it is, a huge opportunity for 98% of the food dollar. Now as a farmer, um, in a high uh, real estate cost market, which Santa Barbara really is a high cost market, you have to be really creative with how you develop the financial uh, uh, soundness to be able to manage a large investment like this. And so some of the things that we did with that is that we started to look at how we, we could nest different enterprises into a system. And so as we developed this prospectus of potential ideas, we then got the okay to go forward and look for land. And we started to you know, scour the region for the right site for the first demonstration of this in our region. And, um, and the investor family was so excited, they felt like this was probably, this, this investment was gonna be the one that they could feel the best about every, that they've had. And they were really excited about getting their money out of that stock market. So we did, ended up, we did end up finding a piece of land, um, a place called Casitas Valley, 50 acre uh, parcel that was uh, six miles from uh, a major potential selling, a place we could sell our, our, um, our wares. And we found that it, it had all the things that we were looking for in the initial prospectus. And so then we had to rebuild the prospectus with the feedback of the land. And so we had to then build it to the land because this landscape had unique features to it that had unique costs involved and unique opportunities. And so we started first by inviting 14 of our family members to move on there with us, and they did. Four generations of our family. My daughter and my son-in-law here, Jesse, who you'll see walking around the conference, super tall, <laughs> tall guy here, you can't miss him. And anyway, and our grandbaby lives there as well as my, my wife's parents, because that was important to us as well, that this was not just an investment, but it was also something that our family <coughs> could put our heart into. And so, we purchased the land um, and we also got investment money, investment capital to develop the enterprises. Now one of the things that I felt was really important was that we didn't do all the enterprises. And I'm finding this when I talk to a lot of other people who are doing investment uh, related, um, especially agriculture related work, is how do you nest enterprises into a farming operation? And so I didn't build a slide around it, I'm just gonna explain it, but basically we zoned, yeah, you all know zonation, or some of you from <laughs> permaculture, we did zones of, of enterprise. So we looked at the core enterprises of this farm, and then we started to look at what enterprises would support the core enterprises that people could come into to, to support. So for example, we have a piggery. And one of the enterprises of one of the young couples that came on there was to develop an aquaponic system that grows fodder in the summertime to feed the pigs because we have no summer rains. And so their enterprise is their own business and they're providing a support for a primary, you know, a zone one enterprise. Our zone one enterprise. So then they're doing what we call a zone two enterprise which is directly supporting that. And then we had other people come in with a whole other business that wasn't necessarily supporting a, the zone one enterprise, but it was an enterprise that worked with the farm. So then that was layered out. And then we had other people with businesses that went further into the community. And then we had people on the land who just put rent in. They just gave some money because they couldn't, uh, they had full-time jobs. So we had these layers of zones to our zone five, which was that you worked off site and you brought money in from a whole nother job that wasn't related. 
and it was, a, it was an interesting dynamic. Then we started to look at how we could lower the expenses of this existing farm that had 160 apple trees, 1,600 avocado trees, and 300 persimmon trees. We wanted a degraded demonstration farm. We wanted a farm that had been really extracted from as a demonstration site. And so this farm had been let go for many, many, many years. And we ended up, um, you know, 90% of the apples were being lost to coddling moth. So we had to get really creative to make it work financially and to be able to show that we could uh, basically, and this isn't showing the whole thing here, I'm not sure why that is, but um, we basically had to start to look at how we could convert current expenses into income sources. And we started by looking at nutrient cycling. So where the apple was, that apple, if we sell an apple as a farm, one of the things that happens is that's the incredible expression of nutrient of that farmscape. You're actually drawing up all the nutrients. That's why an apple tastes so good. And yet you sell it to somebody, they go into the city, they eat the apple, and then they crap in the toilet, it goes into a sewer, and then, and then processed and out to the ocean. So it's not a cycling of the nutrient. That costs the farm money. You have to bring it back, and it also cost us ecological. Our ecological base was being leached by the selling of the apples. So in permaculture fashion, we looked at it and said, wow, what if we developed an education program for kids and we put up compost orchard toilets where the kids come up and bring the crap from the city back up while they're touring through and they actually go in orchard, uh, a movable orchard toilet through our apple orchards to replace the nutrient. And I know that sounds crazy to some people, but immediately we dropped all of our fertilizer bills and we, we created a, a, um, a recycling of nutrient that came in. And then in addition to that, we said, hey, why the kids are here? Why don't they help us process apples? And then what we'll do is we'll actually turn it into, with a press, we'll turn it into, um, why is that not moving? Uh, oops. We turn it into a juice that we can sell. Now the juice is some of the nutrient, but we still end up with some of the pulp. And that pulp stays on the land and we then put that through our piggery operation, which is our most profitable operation um, f as far as money in and money out, but also waste cycling in and nutrient out. The pigs we had to have, not for an economic base, but for a nutrient base to help us build our nutrient to do, to do a working farm. So we have this incredible ability then to go out and seek other nutrient sources, like breweries locally, who were paying to have their brew mash taken away, we then asked them, could we take it for free? And they said, you know what? You take this, you'll save us money, we'll give you free beer. <laughs> yeah, it was like, free beer, this is great. So, uh, but every time our pigs ate a barrel of that, they then left that nutrient on our farm as well. And so we were able to develop a very uh, amazing heritage breed piggery operation that was revitalizing the landscape. And now our cost of doing the work has gone down, but our quality is coming up through good integrated design. Um, we also integrated our chickens with our pigs as well, so we have our chicken operation. And uh, we don't even put them in at night. They just live in the trees above the pigs. They go up there naturally as they do, and then the pigs protect them at night. And of course we have a renewable, biological renewal, renewable system because it's less expensive for us than to go out and buy new stock. So part of the investment, part of the value of long-term uh, resiliency for this project was to have its own cycling of the, 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 base, the, the base operations needed to be biologically reproducing, not us being dependent on a faraway source of the basic needs of, of the farm. And then we developed very unique markets where we do direct sales for higher profits. So for a small farm to make it, you need to sell direct to the consumer. That's one of the things we found with this investment work is that we could capture 90, rather than, rather than getting 10 cents on the dollar selling to an intermediary, we could get 100% of that money 
at a very good rate to the people around us and also be able to then sell at a more reasonable rate so that healthy food was more available to our community because that was one of the goals is that this investment had to build social capital. How are we doing with time? We're almost there? Okay. So we also developed charcuterie. So added value was another important part of this. How do we, how do we add value to the system? And, and then that added value and that additional processing became a livelihood for someone else on the land. So then we started to look at livelihoods as it played out through the people who were on the farm. Um, and we were and, and looked at how we could build a food culture in our community. And that was a big part of how we have now restaurateurs sending their, their chefs to us to learn how to process food directly from the farm. And it's a whole other window of permaculture, is how do we work with restaurants who are moving so much material and getting them to source their, their foods from equitably raised sources like what we're doing. And it's been a stable form of our income as an investment. Um, we also have 1,600 avocado trees. We planted understory ginger, coffee, dragon fruit, goji berries, figs, all of these different fruits to add value to existing monocrops. This was an avocado desert. And yet now we have all these layers that are starting to produce, not only lowering our expenses of water, and nutrient needs within the, within, the, uh, within the orchard, it's actually giving us additional income revenues and also uh, fruit and, and, and stuff to sell to our community and share with our community. That's a thousand pounds each of organic avocados. Um, we also started to work with all of our fruits with uh, distilleries to start to make a uh, distilled persimmon brandy. And um, we, we had a student of mine from a permaculture course uh, developed a, a micro distillery right out, of the, right out of the permaculture course. And we're now working with them to supply things from them locally. How are we doing? We're just about out of time, huh? If you want to have some questions, yeah. Jesse, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, just to wrap, I wanted to, um, it's such a small amount of time, but this, this idea of being able to get more landscapes under ecological production. And for me, I believe it takes an investment strategy right now. Right now, why we have the economic capital moving through the world with the agreement intact. Let's use that to build natural capital to support our community for a new economy that's going to emerge whether we like it or not. The, the current agreement can't maintain itself. And so why don't we use every resource possible right now to build that natural capital? And I think the more we do that, the more landscapes we're going to get into permaculturally designed production. So thank you. Oh, yeah. questions? Yeah, please. Yeah, maybe two or three questions, so these people. Yeah. Um, with your figure, you said it's the most profitable. Um, in my experience, it's hard to make money off of that in terms of the time you put in. Ah. Is it taking a lot of time out, or are you getting a pretty good... Um, well, time so there's a, there's a few layers to that. So all of our food, we have no food cost. Well, one, because we have, uh, we also have, I didn't show you, we have a, a cheese creamery we developed on the side as well. And so we have all the way from that that's processing through the pigs as well. Um, as well as these other sources. So one, that's the biggest expense in, um, in the piggery world is your food cost. And then labor, it's very interesting. We've got it integrated with our, our orchard staff because they're actually providing ecological surface, services for our orchard. So our staff, rather than doing other types of fertilization, this is, we're just dedicating the same amount of time to, to tend to that. And it's become a, uh, enterprise for a young couple that moved on and they're the ones managing it as their own enterprise so they get um, a percentage of all the profits as well and we get a percentage of all the profits we make a thousand dollars a pig a thousand dollars a pig profit on every single pig and we, we sell directly whole pigs to families who buy the entire pig and then they pay for the butchering separately and we literally, um, we have about $300 per pig expenses that incorporates the labor. And, um, and then we have, uh, 
but they also even offer more uh, services than that because they're also fertilizing. So they've dropped other expenses, but giving given us an income. This is the only way. Our farm costs two million dollars, and we put six hundred thousand dollars into it. So we have two point six million dollars into a farming operation. People are like, "You're crazy! How are you going to pay for that?" But you know what? It's working. And there was a lot more that I, if you're interested, my email is warrenbrush at, uh, see, no, I can't get into it, but um, it's uh, uh, warrenbrush, W-A-R-R-E-N-B-R-U-S-H at mac.com. And you can just look up my name and a bunch of stuff will pop up on the internet. Um, Do you have any time for one more question? One more question? Yeah. Yeah, how do you all external investors get a return on their investment within what time period? So right off the bat, um, they're getting 2%. So we gave them 2% right off the bat, and then we have a graduated return on investment. So at the, at the peak of the investment, in the last few years of the investment, they'll be getting over 5%. So on average, the whole investment will yield between 3 and 5%, um, depending on, it could be more if more equity is built than what we forecast. Already the farm's been valued at 3.2 million. So in the first three years, we've, it's already gone up 600,000 in value. And they're just like tickled. They said this is the most stable investment they have in their entire portfolio. They're waiting for the five year mark to pull more money and to put it into more farms. And that's something that I think is a lot of opportunity for the permaculture movement, because you have people with skill sets and you have people with money coming together. What is that place of intersection? And this is just a super small little example of a place of intersection that I think we should be dialoguing about if we're serious about getting out in a lot of different landscapes and also converting extractive farms into soil building farms. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Wow. Yay. <laughs>
somebody, somebody who's put themselves at a lot want to offer a uh, like a reason why they put themselves there. Perhaps a lady with a pink shirt. Yeah. Um, well, uh, because although I grow a very little bit of my own food and have some food on the side, and um, I do make some clothes and so on, but I do buy a lot of things. Yeah, great. So, the okay, the man with the flat. Oh, yes. Um, how I don't depend on money is just uh, how uh, not to spend it, really. <laughs> so, you don't know, spend any money. I go to London, I cycle, I go to the supermarket, I spend £30 a week on organic food. Um, I'm so wearing you these clothes like, every day. <laughs> <laughs> so not too many clothes. Clean them once a week, you know. Okay. But you um, still rely on money to buy your food and I'll shelter, presumably. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Depends. Yeah, okay. You can spend it on something, uh, you, can, you, know, you can spend £200 on a, on a gate, mm -hmm. or you can spend it on you know, a lifetime experience. Yeah. So are you kind of putting yourself a little, you think, relative to society at large, like rather than like, you don't use money, you still use it day to day? Of course, I'm going to be on the street. Okay, great. So next question, how likely are you to get into debt in the future? So, oh, at the back of the room, highly likely. Here, not likely. Okay, everyone's feeling. We don't have too many debtors in here. So, the lady with the brown glass, would you like to say why you put yourself down here? Because I don't like that. I don't have any peso on that. Okay. And I'm sure it's possible to get it without. So you don't, you're not planning on taking out any loans no. or buying a house? No. Okay. I leave my house with my own house without Brilliant. Mm -hmm. Okay, how about the gentleman with the blue shirt? Why have you put yourself a bit further down? Yeah, I didn't get through to what I spent so. <laughs> so you still think you're not going to take out any debt or get into debt in the future? No. Okay. Does anyone feel like they might have to get into debt? Yeah. yeah, do you want to share? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know how it works over in the UK, but in the US, you know, they look at your credit report for buying anything like buying a car or getting an apartment and things of that nature. I'm currently not in any debt, but it seems that the way the system works economically, having a hard time to you know, move out of my parents' house and uh, live on my own and yeah. have a life without going into debt. Yeah, yeah exactly, yeah. It's pretty, pretty, <laughs> in, like, in, virtually impossible. So who, next question is who, whether you would agree or disagree with this statement. Clearly, don't need to get too complicated, but just your kind of initial gut reaction, whether you would agree with money equals power or disagree. So agree is by the window and disagree is by the door. Sorry. Thank you. Okay, so the gentleman with the green trousers, why do you disagree with this statement? Power is not something to do with money, it's to do with uh, the spirit, I guess. Okay. Power in yourself, I don't know. So you're saying the power is spirit and so man is power uh, The lady the purple, why did you agree with the statement? Uh, I think at the moment things like um, if you're involved in politics, Thank you. 
Okay, one more question. Um, where does money come from? I have a strong idea by the window. I have no idea. Sorry, it's been missed off by the door. Okay, so I'm not going to ask the people who said I have no idea. That's what I mean. Uh, So we've got quite a knowing audience here, which is good. Everyone feels like they're confident. So that's what basically the talk's going to be about, is how money is created. But yes, both uh, private banks and central banks by the governments can create money. Um, so thank you, everyone. <laughs> But most of us um, don't really think about how money is created from day to day. And similarly, how if we were going to start from scratch, how we might design a money system. So just going to do one more exercise before I start my talk. So imagine that you are on the desert island, some kind of shipwreck, and there's about 200 people um, that ended up on this completely deserted island. Some people... Like over a few, after a few days of like recovery, people start building shelter. Some people are gathering food. Other people are really good at making fires. Uh, like days, weeks, months go past, and you're kind of building a life there. And everything's getting a bit more complicated in terms of like knowing who does what and the the kind of systems that you're living with are getting a bit more complicated. And one evening, you're sat around a fire after maybe like five years of living on the island and somebody's like oh, do you remember like before we lived on the island there was like something called money that we used to use to like pay things would it like would it be useful to bring that back in because i kind of have to have a relationship with all those all the other 200 people on the island if i want something from them it's getting a bit complicated like could we should we bring that back in to try and pay for things and somebody else says good idea but who would create it um so i just want you to take two minutes and i'm going to time you to talk to your neighbor say hello if you don't know them and come up with an idea for who you might get to create the tokens on your island or how you would decide who would create it <laughs>
want to hear from two people only about what they talked about. Does anyone want to offer what they discussed? Well, no one. That's fine as well. We don't have that much time. Okay, one person put up their hand. So we'll hear from you. Okay, so everybody sits around and says, um, I, I produce uh, three fish a day, equivalent of labour or whatever, project production, and everyone does this. Then we add up all those fish, <coughs> or, or we create symbols for the fish. Mm. Then I can have that many fish symbols, and I can go to you and give you a fish symbol for part of your production, <laughs> and you can do the same. And we just create a currency that way. If we find <coughs> too many fish symbols in the system, we can agree to destroy however many we think of inflationary or whatever. So does one fish symbol <coughs> equal one fish? <coughs> it could start with. Uh, okay. Cool. Okay, that's cool. Right? Okay. We don't have much time. I'll take one more and then we'll keep going. Um, I don't think it's about who is going to create the money, but more about what process are we going to use to yeah, choose yeah. the people. Yeah. And so I just mentioned sociocracy as an, as an option. We can't nice. do that. Sorry, we can't so, that so sociocracy is an option. It's more about who decides who's going to create it. That's her point. You want a democratic okay. system? Okay. So want, yeah, democracy. Uh, That's democracy. great. It's not democracy. Well, democracy. Similar. So sociocracy is where everyone takes part in the decision, right? Yeah, it's um, sociocracy is more um, you decide how you want to process the decision making. Yeah, and, uh, okay. And basically everyone gets to, a group decides to, gets to decide at some point. So it's about the process. Yes. So hopefully we're all at least agreed it's not that straightforward. <laughs> but I think we can do better than the way the money system is organised in pretty much all countries around the world today. And that's what positive money talks about. So just to let you know before I start, um, the slides got converted from PowerPoint to the open source, and so some of them look a bit of a mess, and I didn't have time to fix them. And the other thing is, is if you're interested in positive money and finding out more, I'm going to pass around this sheet. And if you are, just jot down your name and email. But no pressure. <laughs> so <laughs> where does money come from, and why does it matter? So we ask questions like, what is the connection between the money system, the way it works, and inequality? Why is the gap between the rich and poor getting bigger? Seeing in the UK, over a million people using food banks, while stock markets are hitting all-time highs. <coughs> Why are houses too high, house prices too high for people to afford? What is stopping, stopping us tackling climate change? And we kind of start with that by asking the question, like, where does money come from? Who creates it? Because there's a lot of misunderstanding and not that much knowledge out there. So when you ask most people on the street, they'll say the Bank of England or, or the Central Bank. But the, the Bank of England prints notes and coins uh, via the Royal Mint in the UK. But that makes up only about 3% of all money in the economy. And that's about the same for most Western countries, um, so about, it's between up to about five percent is like it, coins and notes um, makes up in terms of all of the money that we use. The remaining is basically digital digital money, numbers typed into a computer system, and that makes up ninety seven percent. And that isn't created by the central bank; that's created by high street banks. So these are the ones that create most money in the UK so the slides are cut off but there's basically only five banks that create most of that 97% of money and the way that they do that is by making loans so it, we don't have this system which I think I certainly thought about money before I joined Positive Money which is that money circulates between houses, companies and banks that isn't how it works and it's not that Banks are these neutral intermediaries between savers and borrowers. Banks create money and they create the vast majority of money that we all use when they make loans. <laughs> it's obviously like some kind of hotspot in here. <laughs> and here's just a quote. Uh, the process by which banks create money is so simple that the mind is repelled. Because quite a few of us find that a bit shocking. I know I did when I found out about it. And just to, to show that this is correct. Here's a quote from the Bank of England that came out last March. 
and I'll just read it because it's, it's kind of cut off, but basically they just said the principal way in which um, money is created is through commercial banks making loans, which creates new money. And this is different from how uh, money is created, differs from how the story is found in most economics textbooks. So there's a lot of uh, misunderstanding out there. Most economists think of banks as neutral intermediaries rather than creators of money, which is a large part of what they do. So I don't think this graph is going to work, but we'll just go with it. This is just to show how much they've created. Basically, the green line is cash. This is 1950, and this is about now. So you can see the last 60 years, this is the UK, the amount of bank-issued money has kind of gone off the scale, increasing from about 30 billion down here, which was in 1970, to about 500 billion, which is in about 1990, to about uh, 2.2 trillion just before the crash in 2008. So it kind of went crazy. Okay, so they're creating all this money and they're lending it to us. And we obviously have to repay all of that money with interest. So we're in effect renting our money supply from the commercial banks, which get to create it out of nothing when they make loans. In the UK, that adds up to about 100 to 200 billion pounds that we're transferring from people doing stuff to the banks for having the privilege to create our money. So it's a vast kind of extraction of money from the rest of us to the banking system. So they get to create it, and then they also get to decide where to allocate it. So as I said in the UK, we have a very undiverse banking system. We have five big banks that control most of the kind of market share. And really, they're the ones that are deciding, the people that are deciding where it gets allocated are the people at the top of the bank. So it's a very small number of people that are allocating this money. And in the five years up to the crash, they allocated almost three trillion pounds. And this is where they put it. 40% went into mortgage lending, about 37% went into financial markets. So that's almost 80% into property and financial markets. And only 13% went into businesses. What most of us think that banks do is actually a really small amount of their activity. And a further 10% went to high cost credit. So hardly any of it is going into what we might think as productive uh, use, what we call the real economy. And the vast majority is going into non-productive stuff, mortgage lending and <coughs> financial markets and speculation. And what that results in is housing bubbles, and we all end up under a mountain of debt. Because if you remember, when a bank makes a loan, it creates money. So for every pound in your bank account, there's a pound of debt somewhere else. <coughs> so if the uh, money supply increases by £100, then there also is £100 of debt. But more than that, if we have a crisis such as we did in 2007 and banks panic and stop lending, then <coughs> the amount of money shrinks. Because when, if banks stop lending, but we keep repaying our debts, then the kind of stock of money shrinks and there's less money to go around which can lead to a recession and even a depression. So you get headlines like this which is Prime Minister of the UK politicians basically asking banks to lend trying desperately to lend but it's not really up to them You know, it's down to whether the banks want to lend and it's fundamentally the system that's broken. So we have a situation where if we want more money then we need more then we have to take on more debt but obviously, we're really indebted, so we want less debt. But if we have less debt, then we have less money. And really, we need a situation where we have less debt and more money. But in the current system, that's impossible. That's basically what positive money is advocating. But I'll talk for a few more minutes until my time runs out. Just a quick quote from uh, pre the previous governor of the Bank of England saying, of all of the many ways of organising banking, the worst is the one we have today. Okay, so just a quick couple of notes on some of the consequences. So there's this myth that, you know, all we need to do is give rich people loads of money that will somehow trickle down. We all know that's bollocks. Um, but one of the, way, one of the ways that it is bollocks is that 
through the money system because actually by us renting our money from the banking sector um, the banks are sucking up money through interest payments but it's also a system where you find that there's a disproportionate amount of money paid on interest of your income if you're poor compared to your rich there's this other way of increasing inequality that has gone totally messy again it's this powerpoint to open source basically that's almost a point here like the geo so money being sucked geographically from everywhere to the banking sector and also if you're rich you take out debt to buy assets uh, or speculate on assets whereas if you're poorer you take out debt to buy consumables which depreciate through time so you have this other factor in increasing inequality uh, that's again <laughs> gone completely messy basically um, that graph was going to show up until the crash house prices mortgage lending population growth and housing stock and kind of the idea is to show that it's not really this supply and demand problem we're told about it's banks flooding the mortgage market with money that's increasing house prices and it's not as if that increases the own people that are able to afford houses because if you look in the UK um, up to the crash the actual number of houses that were owned by the occupier went down so it's really about buy to let people getting on the kind of housing speculative uh, market basically Oh, we kind of see it. So this is mortgage... Oh, no, you can't see it. <laughs> so it's cut off. Okay, let's keep going. So by banks lending, basically... Oh, this is not working completely. Fuels these asset bubbles. Uh, I'll just see if we can keep going. No, okay. <laughs> basically, the PowerPoint's completely given up. It looks better on the, uh, the little pictures. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Press the press. What's that? The side banners. Is it useful to see or should I just talk? No, the side banners are, are okay. Yeah? You can I just make them bigger. I'll just quickly see if it'll get to where it was. A recap. Okay, <laughs> yeah. so this is, in case you missed it, banks create money when they make <laughs> loans, <laughs> and we have to pay those loans back with interest, and most of it goes into property and financial markets, and it has consequences like inequality, housing bubbles, and then I was just getting on to democracy. So last summer, we polled MPs to gauge how much they knew about money, and only one out of ten MPs knew that when a bank made a loan it created money and 71% of MPs thought, think that the sole issue of money in the UK is the Bank of England so they really don't understand how many percent? Okay, wow. uh, so one in ten understood how it works and yeah, seven out of ten thought, think that the Bank of England creates money yeah. So this was just some stats to show what, what a housing crisis we have on our hands in the UK. Homelessness, a lot of people that have taken out mortgages are really living you know, on the line with be, being able to pay them back. And a lot of people um, have high debt. So also with a debt-based money system, as uh, both governments and the households become more in debt, uh, then it weakens democracy. And just to show that uh, the amount of money the government spent is actually much smaller than the amount of money banks lent, which, as I said, was f almost three trillion in the to the crash. So they really have the power to shape the direction of the economy. And obviously, in the UK, what they're doing is putting most of it into property and financial markets, which, which shifts our whole economy to being focused on those things. As I said, we polled the MPs. Most of them don't know how money is created. Just Finally, a couple of words about the environment. So we have a system where banks create money, so they get to decide how to use it. So if they want, they can be financing tar sands. And also, there's no transparency how our savings are used. So when we deposit our money in the bank, the legal owner of that money is no longer us, it's the bank. So they can decide exactly what they, they do with it. And through these cycles of banks creating lots of money, until we kind of reach breaking point in terms of debt and financial crises occurring, 
then we have this boom and bust financial system and that can lead to short termism. So as soon as you have a crash, the first thing for governments to roll back is obviously the environmental regulation that you know the civil society has fought hard to win because they say they just need to get the economy going. I think I'm going to stop there, um, but just a couple of words on our proposals. So we propose what we call a sovereign money system, where the money, we think basically money creation should be nationalised, um, and it should be created without debt, and it should be spent into the real economy. So places like Warren's farms should be getting investment, um, and creating jobs that we need. And we shouldn't be having this you know, boom and bust in unstable system where banks create too much money until we hit a crisis. You know, we should be able to not have this instability. OK, I'll stop there. today is Mark Boyle and so I'm here to introduce him and Mark didn't want to do a PowerPoint, he wanted to have a conversation that we would begin and then hopefully we will then kind of seed out that conversation into this room. I don't know how it's going to happen but it's going to happen somehow. And um, so I want to introduce Mark Boyle to you. So Mark is most, you know, his tabloid kind of cartoon self is the moneyless man that, you know, goes into the Guardian without a shirt on and gets totally ripped apart by the pundits in the comments section. Um, actually, I think he's a really brave man. 
He lived without money for three years, uh, totally outside the financial system, having done his education as an economist. Um, um, then, so he's a man of paradox. He then came back into the money system to set up um, a permaculture freeholding in Ireland. And this is, say the Gaelic. The Gaelic. I'm Chuck Sear. Yeah, okay, thank you. It means the free house. So it's, he set up, he's setting up the free house. Some of you will know that he has just completed a building conversion with an absolutely totally minimalist money called the Happy Pig, which is going to be one of the first free pubs in the world, but also a training centre where people can come and reskill and rest and recuperate and not pay money. So, so like the moneyless theme, you can hear is going on. But what we're here today for is to talk about um, the concept of drinking Molotov cocktails with Gandhi. Um, and we, we, we wanted to explore some of the stuff that we uh, that Mark's written about in this latest book that I worked, have had pleasure and privilege of working with him about. Um, and really what this book is exploring the sort of systemic disease of money and how it's been, uh, and the first speaker really nailed it, it's been redesigned under our noses. So money as a medium of exchange has been colonised by the machine, and we'll talk about this, and, and it's been repurposed, and it is not to our benefit. So this book really deeply explores that. It also explores the sort of concept of why we have to engage, and how revolutions have occurred, and how they're not always just non-violent, but sometimes we have to be standing up and heard and active and direct. So it talks about the rewilding of the political landscape. So these are the kind of things that we want to explore in relationship to money. So Mark, tell us. And if he talks too softly, wave at him. <laughs> well, I'm Irish, so and I've been living back in Ireland for a couple of years again, so my accent has got a lot thicker. Again, I've been living in England for 10 years. I softened. Um, so yeah, if you can't hear me at the back, then do shout. Um, but yeah, I guess coming back to I suppose your friend's presentation, I was the guy who's kind of going like on the desert island. Let's not reinvent the tokens again because I think the tokens are a big part of the problem. Um, I guess for me, well, like even though I totally agree with Fran in terms of um, the way we create money being hugely problematic, that's. You know, for me that's obvious you know and, and it's brilliant that you're bringing them out there um i guess my perspective is that no matter how we create it still disconnects us from what we consume so um if you think about all the things we consume normally in a day right which of us has any connection with 99 percent of those things you know we might get a revenge from the local farmer um if you know if, if, if such a possibility exists um but if you look at our light bulbs look at our walls look at all these different things um, we're totally disconnected from it. And the problem with this is that the huge supply chains that we have are, are, are entirely destructive. A lot of really bad stuff. Like I studied marketing as part of my business degree. And I, we, were, we were literally told to keep the producer away from the consumer. That's, that's your marketing goal. You know, keep, them, keep them as far apart as possible. Um, because you do not want to see what goes on in between. You just don't want to see it. Like if, you know... Uh, who of us, when we go to the supermarket to buy some food, do we think about the oil, how the oil is produced along the way? Do, do, we, do, we, do we consider that? Do we think of the devastation that causes? You know, um, you know when, we're, when we're getting some food from the cafe, do we think about like, you know, how the animals were treated or when we go and pick up our four pound t shirt from Top Man or whatever? Do we think about you know, uh, the conditions that the people who work in the factories who make it live in? Because you know, we're totally separate from it. And the, the, the tool that allows us to be so disconnected from that is money, in any form. You know, I, I, like I'm really supportive of local currencies and all that, but a, a local currency can only ever be um, as local as the econ economy that it represents. You know, so if, if the physical goods in your economy are only 1% or 2% local, then you, you can never have a currency that's any more than 1% or 2% local, because you need 
Like if you're getting <coughs> food with plastic wrapped around it, you need to have a currency that can go many, many miles away. So, um, so, the, the, so, uh, like I think what I agree with Fran is that if we could actually like if we if we could um, change the way money is created, that would be a massive step um, towards a much better world. But it still, for me, doesn't actually address the problem of disconnection to what we consume. And so, yeah, I'd be the guy who would actually call for uh, not reinventing the credits on the desert island because I think that uh, what, you, what you get in the end is like the next islands realize that they can use your credits. Um, and so you end up swap, swapping credits with them, and then you go further and further and further until you go where we are today in a globalized world where um, none of us have any connection with what we consume. Um, and just think of, just sit with that for a second, just think of the consequences of everything we, we buy today. Like, it's, it's a hyper violent society. Like, we, we talk about ISIS in the news about being like a brutal culture. It's no more brutal than our culture. We, it, it, like, the consequences of, the, of what we buy every day for anything other than a human being is massive. Absolutely massive. We're wiping out life on Earth. You know, we're, we're anything between 10,000 and 100,000 species a year are being wiped out. And we don't even know we're doing it because we're completely separate from it. So, so I see that, that was one of my kind of big realizations coming from the kind of business and economics world that I've been in. I kind of just got lucky I got a job in organic food um, where I got in touch with all these kind of weird and wacky people, you know, like kind of food growers and beekeepers and that kind of stuff. And I actually started learning about the real economy, you know, like about, we think back, in, we, even like, even in our circles, we use the word economy to mean like finance. We, we confuse the words economy and finance. Um, they're not the same thing. Like, we have, to, we have to separate those words. Like, if I said to you, what's the economy, the, the economic section in the newspaper about? You'd probably think about money, wouldn't you? We think about finance. But economics is about how we meet our needs. It's absolutely nothing to do with finance. And so got, that just got me really thinking, like, what, like, what have I been doing with my education, with my economics education? It's like, I should have been out, you know, with the permaculturists and the food growers and all that stuff, because that's the real economy. Um, so that's, that was the kind of like the real route into um, to living without money, I guess, for me, was just that realisation, like we have to start getting connected to what we consume. And for me, so then I give up um, money for, initially, for it was like a one-year experiment. They didn't know if it would last um, a week or last, you know, a day, but it got a lot of publicity at the time, which meant I couldn't really give up, because I would have been <laughs> embarrassing. I already had an embarrassing experience before that, where I tried to walk to India with no money, and that turned out to be an epic failure. Oh. Um, so I, I didn't. How did you get to I got to France. <laughs> 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 Don't trust me, man. And the observer will write an article about uh, like how to fail really well, using me as an example. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I didn't want to do that again, really. Um, and yeah, and, and just uh, I wanted to see how, what it felt like as a human being to have to connect with everything you consumed, what that actually meant, you know. Um, because that's really where it's at. You know, if we want to, if we want to live really gentle um, uh, lives that are in harmony with the rest of life and not exploiting it, then we need to we need to cons connect with everything we consume. And there's really hard questions involved, which we, which we don't want to ask. You know, we're, we're afraid to ask them. Like we, we sometimes in these circles we can go around in bubbles, thinking, you know, we're all on the we're all going the right path and so on. But like, go home and switch on your light this evening. What's where's the light bulb you made? You know, how do you, how do you make a light bulb? You know, how do you make anything that's in your house? Your toaster. Can anybody make a toaster? Mm -hmm. Does anybody know where the, where the copper comes from in the electrical wire? Or, or the rubber around that? You know, where are all these things made? Can we continue doing them? That's a big question. Can we continue making these things? <coughs> and what are the consequences of it if we are? Are we, are we prepared to wipe out life on Earth? Because we don't want to ask difficult questions. And so... So from, from, the, like, from the experience of living without money, I guess, uh, I started to learn uh, as I went along. So I started off with a few kind of understandings and the more I'd done it, the more I felt like I was getting a, a clear picture of the whole thing. Um, I learned, actually one critical thing I learned was like, my, as I said, my connection to, um, to the rest of life. So I'd live, be, I'd live beside a spring and a stream where, which is where I got my water from. And I remember like going down in the glen one day and just cupping up some water and and drinking the water from my hands and realizing like where do I begin and where do I end? You know like why why uh, am I just a skin encapsulated ego here like this you know blob of flesh and bones? 
because like at, at the moment my, my mouth's open right now I'm breathing in air like there like I am not just this body I'm everything I'm interconnected to every single thing I'm, I'm my health and my well-being is dependent on the health and well-being of everything else um, and so if somebody comes along and throws oil in that stream I'm dead you know that, that's, that's my, my body is 60% water you know it's most of me isn't even human um, and so I, I realized that like the, that my own personal health was dependent on the health of everything else. And the, and the really c critical thing for this for me was that um, when I realized that, I realized I had to defend these things. Because, like I would defend and attack on my own body. Because that's what it comes down to. Like, I, feel, I, I feel like I'm getting attacked by big business, by the state, by the corporate world. Because they're attacking the very fundamentals of my body. And we need to think of it like that. We need to think of, of it as an attack. We, we, are, we are life. We are everything. There is no separation. <coughs> the separation is an illusion. Um, and so that was one major understanding. The second thing was that the Daily Mail is very, very useful as toilet paper. But so, <laughs> uh, so I used to poo on a compost loo and so on. And you get to go through different publications. And uh, that I, I never really saw a sense in the Daily Mail until, until I did with money. I could give it a new purpose. Um, but I guess, I guess the, the kind of big thing really was. That uh, cause I was I was very very influenced by um, as Molly knows by, by Gandhi originally, uh, and the whole idea of being the change you want to see in the world, um, and I think that's a really crucial um, thing that we all need to kind of do and be, um, like what changes you want to see and how do you be it. But the other thing is also is that um, whilst I was living being the change that you know I thought I wanted to see in the world, I was looking out and species are still going extinct, you know. We're still fracking, we're still bottom crawling, we're still sweat shopping, <laughs> we're still factory farming. Um, and me living in a field, uh, you know, doing my thing, may have had impact, may not, I don't know. Uh, the, still, the stuff is still happening. Uh, do we just forget about that or do we tackle that as a, something that's really, really important to us? And so I guess I became really politicised in the whole process as I've been working with Mali on the second book called Mali's Manifesto. And She's probably seen my own kind of politicisation over the years. Um, and I got to the point where um, I felt that activism wasn't working anymore. It hasn't been working for a long time. You know, democracies are meant to hold power to account, but democracy is fundamentally flawed today. You know, it's the narratives are controlled by the media and by big business. Um, and, and so we have spin doctors. The fact that there's actually a job called a spin doctor means that democracy can't work. Yeah. Just think about it. There's somebody out there who's, 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 who's taking the truth and spinning it mm -hmm. to us mm -hmm. so that we, you know, so that we go along with what their agenda is. Mm -hmm. like, that, like the fact that Alistair Cameron calls that spin doctor openly, I just find absurd that we just accepted that. Mm -hmm. um, and so activism should come in when democracy fails. That's the, third, that's the next step to hold power to account. And activism just isn't working. Like every every situation we're facing in the world, like it, this, this is a much different talk than the rest of the talk because everybody's saying all the positive stuff and like we can do this kind of stuff. And I totally support that. That's what we should be leaving here with. But it's also important to remember that the things that aren't working, because otherwise we're just clapping ourselves in the back and feeling good about ourselves. Um, and a lot of things aren't working. You know we're. We are literally wiping out life on Earth, and we're one of the species on the endangered species list. Yeah, um, it's not just a bunch of other species. Once they go, and enough of them go, we're somewhere down the list. I don't exactly know where. Probably sometimes it's shortly after the bees. Mm -hmm. um, yes. And so, can, uh, I, can I ask you? Um, in your book, you you write about becoming the the political wolf. Mm. You know about this concept of rewilding politics so what do you mean can you explain that concept of us becoming wolves yeah it's a really I don't know you guys probably know George Monbiot who's yeah. um, feral yeah mm -hmm. and the whole idea in Yellowstone National Park where the doctor had reintroduced the wolf and suddenly life started flourishing again you know in ways that people couldn't have imagined originally and I thought about this, and I thought about like if, if you've probably seen the Lord of the Rings as well, have you? Yeah? I spoke about this at the book launch a little bit earlier. Um, and in Lord of the Rings, well, what Tolkien understood was there's a role for each of the different types of 
people. You know, you've got the little fun loving hobbits, which I'm probably a little bit of, you know, <laughs> dancing on tables and drinking ale. And then you've got the spiritual elves who are up in the you know, up in the trees and doing their thing. And then you've got the warriors of Gondor and Rohan and so on. And what Tolkien understood and this came from Joseph Campbell as well, is that like there's a role for all of these different types of character. And what you find in like activism these days is that the wolf has been eradicated from the political landscape just as much as he's been eradicated from uh, the, from the ecological landscape. Um, everything now uh, we've we've been given a narrative by um, the powers that be that um, that non-violence is the only way you can protest, right? And there's I'm not saying that I I think non-violence should be the way we should treasure everything. You know, as non-violent thing as possible. But to think that we're actually living uh, non-violent lives today is a joke. Like every, like our culture is heavily <coughs> violent. You know, so we're not even starting from a non-violent position. You know, look, look at look at the supply chains behind every single thing we consume, and it's, and it, and it, there's, there, it, it's it's full of violence the whole way along. So let's 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 be honest about that first. Um, then secondly, it's like from there, where do we go? Like, we, do we keep on going with the with the forms of activism that we've been using for the last twenty years or longer? Are they so working? Could you just speak a bit more clearly because it's a yeah. lot of non-native speaking. Yeah, cool. Of course. We're not uh, from the. I'm I'm a non-native speaker as well. I'm not. <laughs> 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 Some people can understand the issue. Sorry. Yeah. yeah, yeah sure. Slowly. Of course. Yeah. yeah sorry. Um. Can you just. Uh, sorry. Can you repeat everything? <laughs> <laughs> Okay. You're the same. Look at the supply chains of what we consume. Yeah. Why, why activism doesn't yeah. work? Activism. Oh, yeah, you're just yeah. spinning me where I was. Yeah. Right? <laughs> no, yeah, 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 I understood that. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so like I see activism is not working at the moment. You know, in terms of holding power to account, um, I do feel that we need to be honest with that. And I think when when I speak in the book about. Um, introducing the wolf back into the political economy. We all we understand the nature of the wolf, yeah. Like he's yeah. What, like most of us are afraid of the wolf. Yeah, he's a fierce creature. But like the the whole concept is that the top pre when you reintroduce the top predator, they kill off the things that you have too many of, and then that reintroduces biodiversity. So I'm interested metaphorically what you think in our culture is the. Top which top predator do we need to reintroduce into no, no, our no, culture? No, no, no. It's not killing off. It's just killing off a little bit, but mostly mm -hmm. keeping the grazers in specific places so they don't harm the forest. And moving them on yeah. after they've manured. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so the killing is just a little part of it. But still, the question so remains, who, is, who is that top predator? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, so, a lot of questions here. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe a little bit of decorum. Um, I'm joking. Uh, yeah, so, uh, like, if you're asking who, uh, who's the top predator, it's, like, it's, there's n it's not like, um, in, each, in this room here, there are a lot of different types of character. Like, what activism does today is say, uh, the character who's the wolf, he's bad, he needs, he needs to leave. And there's a lot of in-house fighting about like my way is right, your way is wrong, all this kind of stuff. <coughs> Activism movement is just destroyed by it most of the time. We spend most of our energy arguing amongst ourselves, not respecting each other's calling. So, so and, and, the, and the failure there is the, is the failure to recognise we all have a different character. You know, I'm not a I'm not a spiritual elf in Tolkien's Legendarium. I'm, I'm probably a mixture of a Hobbit and somebody from Rohan. Uh, that's a kind of a weird mix. Um, <laughs> but, you know, but what, so what, we, what, is, what I'm really talking about is it's, it's starting to to reunite as activists of all sorts. Like there is no <coughs> there is no one or one or right or wrong way to be active. And you're um, saying really, don't be afraid. If any of you out there are political wolves, you know, stand up because we need you in our ecosystem. You know, we need that power to overcome the desperately destructive and terrible machine that has been birthed as part of our culture that we are brainwashed to accept and think is okay. That's exactly, I think, yeah. the essence. And also as well that like if if um, if you're not the wolf and you're you're someone who wants to plant seeds, 
then then respect the person who's the wolf because it's not in his nature to plant seeds. Um, and if you th- if you think of it from another metaphor, it's like what what basically permaculture is being uh, and what it does incredibly well is plant seeds. So if you think of the the, the, the growing, it's going around planting these beautiful little seeds every day. But what's happening at the moment is that these seeds can't germinate fully because of <coughs> big, huge dead trees that need to be taken out, you know, to let the light in so these new seeds can grow. And it takes both to do that. Like you, you need people who are willing to do the kind of reformist actions of planting seeds and and, uh, and coming up with new solutions, which which is what like probably 90% of the speakers here today talk about. Mm-hmm. Uh, my job here is a different type of character, is to say we also need the people with who can take out the the, the, the dead trees that are actually blocking out the light and, and let a little bit of, you know, a, a little bit in. Um, so I don't know what if you want, it's kind of opening itself up to questions anyway, kind of organically, which I suppose is all part of the anarchistic way of thing. Once upon a time, I was told that the best things in life are free. <laughs> the first thing they took away was water. Because when I was a boy, you used to drink water and nuts and it didn't use bother about it. Then they polluted it. Right? So the best thing, what to you after water, air, and perhaps forage, is there in our society which gives you the greatest contentment and pleasure? What gives me the greatest content- contentment, contentment and pleasure, enjoyment? By uh, making love. <laughs> <laughs> no. No. <laughs> no, 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 just spending a whole eight hours, you know, frolicking around making love, consuming nothing and eating berries from a certain area. <laughs> it's a very simple way of doing things. Thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm still struggling with this idea of violence because I'd like to know what are the weapons of the wolf? What are the weapons that actually work? And what are the weapons that simply recreate the violence that we're trying to ir- uh, get rid of in our system? Uh, how, do we, how do we fight this violence effectively? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I think this is key to it. It's like, um, I think the really important thing, all of this is not to be prescriptive. You know, because what works, I know that it sounds like an easy cop-out answer, but it's a really important one. When we start being prescriptive about what's the, this is the way we should do it, that doesn't work for every situation. You know, you've got people resisting and, you know, maybe Native Americans resisting in America, where they've come to the point where they know they have to resist with weapons. You know, that, that works for them. Or maybe in some other part of the world, it's a, a non-violent approach is the best approach. You know, it has to be on a case-by-case scenario. Like, to think of it, like non-violent protest today is not non-violent. Um, Nelson Mandela spoke really well about this. You know, it's, there's no, there's uh, a, a, like a ineffective action is not non-violent because it's only violent towards the people who are, who are the victims. You know, the, the violence still happens. It's just we like to clean our hands from the whole thing. So it really is about looking at each individual situation and, and what that needs. You know, like you, I think we, we all in this room can come up with our own solutions to you know what we think is the best weapon you know I, 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 I can't emphasize enough I want the most of the weapons to be non-violent ones the non-violent should always be the first protocol in everything we do um, can I make a comment yeah, of course. so lush cosmetics um, someone was here yesterday <coughs> and he made a re really, he was talking about re-establishing um, kicking out the loggers and re-establishing a polycultural farm. Um, that would create local income. And he, 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 he didn't have time to go into detail, but it was really obvious that getting rid of those loggers and setting up a local um, you know, system was not a non-violent action. But, the, but it, you know, ultimately they had to resist to stop the degradation and begin something regenerative. Yeah. There's lots of examples. Like in the book, I go through like historically, um, what you know, what has worked and what hasn't worked. Even in my own country, Ireland, you know, um, there's many examples. 
Um, I think. I'd suggest that perhaps the weapon that we're under there is mm. money, but all the withholding of it. I, I was hoping positive money were going to venture into it, but we're heading down the route of cryptocurrencies and certainly crowdfunding, mm. which, which divert around the bank. That's a huge weapon if we just withhold it. I'd agree with that. I think that not putting money in the bank means that the fractional reserve system doesn't work so they can't create more debt. So they can create more debt with every dollar you put in the bank. So not putting it in there or lending it in your own local community to the people you know is going to make a huge difference. And if everybody does that, the banks just disappear. <coughs> I personally think that, uh, like what the fuller, that we can't fight for the same systems that have been making problems. That we have to find other models. And this is a wonderful thing, and the reason why I'm in permaculture for now 40 years. And um, the reason why I to it in 1980 when I, well, I'm an <laughs> but anyway, but I jumped to it when I learned about it in Australia and brought it back here to Europe. And, and then within five years, my dear wife took over the problem of the money that Morrison wrote about in just one half chapter in his, in his second book. And she came to the conclusion that, in point of fact, we need what we call people money. People money, and that's coming from below. And not now very uh, rich people are deciding to put money into uh, what was the first uh, contribution there. It's, it, I think it's a good contribution. But in point of fact, we have to try and get the people from below working on it, like we are doing with the land in Africa. Yeah. And so uh, I, I can see that that's, that's a, a, a situation that many feel, if you talk too quickly about a complementary currencies and put them aside, then I'm, you're giving the wrong impression of what I think should be really happening. Yeah. And thank you for that. And like, I'm, like so I'm, as you said, I'm very supportive of local currencies, but I, I do think they need to be honest to you and uh, how local they can be. Um, but also, I couldn't disagree more with what Mr. Fodder's quote. To be honest, um, like he was a, he was an inventor. What he what he was saying, you know, about like create something new to replace the old, that works in the realm of products. It doesn't work in the realm of politics. Lots of people are inventing new ways or have invented many ways of social um, structure. Um, but it's not just as simple as inventing and we all move there. There are some entrenched structures that we call the establishment that are an obstacle. And it's an obstacle for a permaculture movement too, you know. Like permaculture, like I'm, I'm a permaculturist, it's the most incredible solution I've ever ex experienced. You know, I couldn't, you know, that's, this is where it's at for me. But I also recognise the fact that there's huge obstacles to permaculture taking off. You know, it's like, um, access to land being a massive one, you know, wealth <coughs> distribution, you know, private, the concept of private property, like we need deep, radical political change. And, and, this, and, and voting every five years for Tory or Labour is just not going to do it. Mm. So we have to be honest about that. Okay, so this is a very long conversation. Mark is going to be at the Pumpkotch Magazine bookshop area for the next few hours. Please come and talk to him. If you don't want to invest in Amazon.co.uk, <laughs> please come to us or go online. Can I just say, before Amazon, we had zero cash in our bank account. We reinvested our surplus. We now have minus £25,000 uh, in deficit in our bank account. We're still investing surplus, but you know that's the impact of the machine mm. on us little guys. So invest in your small local publisher. Please come and see Mark. And if you loved what he said, or you couldn't 
quite understand his Irish brawl. <laughs> we filmed the whole presentation and we'll put it online for you, taking it for With subtitles. With subtitles. <laughs> What I really like to take away from this is that it's just to do whatever makes you come alive individually. I'm not saying there's like that if if you want to go and plant beautiful seeds like Warren and Fran and, and change the system in that way, then if that's your passion, just go and do what you're passionate about doing. But if you're also the wolf, don't be afraid to be the wolf. So anyway, thank you guys.